This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is Episode 90, Case Update Special, Number 5. In this episode, I will provide updates on more of the cases I've covered on previous episodes of the podcast. As I mentioned last week, I hope to release more of these update specials between now and the end of the year. The cases discussed in today's episode include those of Serenity Sutley, Josias Marquez, James Beale, Arabella Parker, and Brinley and Connor Snyder. Before I get into the updates, I'd like to give shout-outs to my newest patrons, Lisa T. from Sulphur, Louisiana, Marsha K. from Maynardsville, Tennessee, Hannah L. from Bunbury, West Australia, and a special patron who asked to remain anonymous but made a monthly pledge in the name of Amy Deal, whose story I covered way back in Episode 9 of the podcast. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart for your support. To make a pledge, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod. With that said, let's get into this batch of updates. In Episode 21, I told you the story of Serenity Jaslyn Skye Blankenship Sutley, a beautiful baby girl with big blue eyes whose fine blonde hair and baby teeth were just beginning to grow in. Serenity had just celebrated her first birthday about a month before, when, on October 7, 2017, her mother, 22-year-old Kelsey Blankenship, found baby Serenity dead in her crib in the family's apartment in Conneaut, Ohio. An autopsy revealed the horrific truth that Serenity had been raped and beaten her death caused by blunt force trauma to the head. Kelsey's 37-year-old boyfriend, Joshua Gerdo, was charged with aggravated murder, three counts of murder, one count of rape, one count of felonious assault, and one count of domestic violence. Before he could be apprehended, he fled, leading police on a three-week manhunt that culminated in his arrest at a convenience store in Franklin Park, Pennsylvania. A year after Serenity's death, Kelsey was also arrested and charged with two counts of felony murder, one count of felonious assault, two second-degree counts of endangering children, one third-degree count of endangering children, and one misdemeanor count of domestic violence. After Kelsey's indictment, the death penalty specification attached to Joshua's aggravated murder charge was dropped. Nick Iorochi, who was at the time the Ashtabula County prosecutor, declined to explain why that decision was made, saying it was the fair and correct thing to do, and that the reason may come to light in the future. In December of 2020, as I mentioned in episode 44, case update special number two, Joshua was indicted in a 2004 rape case after an investigation by the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation's relatively new cold case unit. This was actually the first indictment connected to the cold case unit's work. Joshua, who was accused of breaking into a house in 2004 and raping a woman, was charged with two first-degree felony counts of aggravated burglary, one first-degree felony count of rape, and one second-degree count of felonious assault. Kelsey's trial was scheduled for February of 2021, but it was not to be. Instead, the new Ashtabula County prosecutor, Colleen O'Toole, announced in early March that her office had reached a stipulated plea and sentencing agreement with Kelsey. In exchange for pleading guilty to reduce charges of involuntary manslaughter, a first-degree felony, and third-degree felony child endangerment, Kelsey's remaining charges were dismissed, and on March 5, 2021, Kelsey Marie Blankenship was sentenced by Common Pleas Judge Marianne Cezanne to six years in prison on the manslaughter charge and three years for child endangerment, although the two sentences were ordered to run concurrently. She received credit for 887 days served. Although it hasn't officially been reported, rumor has it that Kelsey's plea deal also included her agreement to testify against her ex-boyfriend at his murder trial. 
On March 24th, Kelsey, Ohio Department of Corrections inmate number W106992, was transferred to the Ohio Reformatory for Women in Marysville. Her expected release date is listed as October 15th, 2024. Prosecutor O'Toole said in a statement, The death of this child was a tragedy for not only the family, but for the community as a whole. My sadness and condolences go out to all those affected by this tragic death. The conviction and sentencing of Ms. Blankenship provides a step toward the finality and closure needed for the family. To some, this stipulated plea agreement for a six-year sentence may seem too little for the loss of the life of a child. This agreement accurately describes Ms. Blankenship's role in this death, as proven by the evidence, but also allows Ms. Blankenship to admit and accept her accountability and allows the family and victims to heal and move forward. Finality is necessary for the family and the victims in this matter and society. Nothing we can do will bring this beautiful, innocent child back to us. Ms. O'Toole also acknowledged the efforts of the local and state law enforcement agencies who took part in the investigation. If it was not for them and their exceptional and rigorous investigation work on this case, there would be no justice for serenity. As far as Joshua Gerdo, who was accused of brutally raping and murdering this tiny, sweet girl, I was stunned to hear in October of 2021, four full years after Serenity's murder, that despite the viciousness of his alleged crimes, Joshua had been offered a plea agreement by the prosecution that could reportedly see him out of prison within his lifetime. On October 6th, a local resident posted a call to action on the Ashtabula County Courthouse Group Facebook page, asking people to send letters and emails to Prosecutor O'Toole and to protest outside the courthouse during a subsequent hearing. Someone sent me that post the following day, which was, coincidentally or not, the four-year anniversary of Serenity's death, and of course I shared it on my social media profiles and sent a strongly worded email to Prosecutor O'Toole myself. Her response on October 11th read as follows. Thank you for reaching out about this case and the tragedy and injustice that has befallen Serenity and her family. I am sorry for the loss of this child. I am thankful that you have taken up this cause on your podcast. I am saddened and angry that this child suffered in this way, and I am dedicated to discovering the complete system failure which resulted in her death. I am also vested with holding those accountable who have committed these crimes. I am legally precluded from discussing the terms of the plea offer until it is finalized. However, rest assured that a plea offer is not a get-out-of-jail-free card, and in essence, when properly executed, serves the same function as a trial, and that is to convict a defendant of the exact crime he has committed in which he takes responsibility for, and that can and would be proven beyond a reasonable doubt if the case was tried by a jury. The plea process is contained within the normal life cycle of a criminal case, and occurs in almost all criminal cases. The reason for a plea is that it offers finality and solace to victims to know justice was served. It also eliminates the possibility of acquittal on one or more charges and the possibility of the verdict being reversed on appeal, causing more pain to victims to have to relive the process. Additionally, it allows the victims to move forward and to not have to be re-traumatized by testifying under cross-examination. I do appreciate Ms. O'Toole's response, and I completely understand the points she made, but without knowing the terms of this specific agreement, I couldn't rest easy until I knew more. In a statement to WKYC 3 News, Ms. O'Toole said, A plea agreement allows the defendant to be held accountable for the crimes and adds certainty to the outcome. There is no certainty in the outcome of a trial and no finality in the appeals process. She said she had been working with Serenity's immediate family in regard to the plea agreement. At a confidential status hearing on October 14th that was closed to the public, multiple family members attended wearing shirts bearing Serenity's name and photo. The closed session lasted all morning, and just after noon, an open hearing was conducted at which Judge Cezanne said she would take the proposed plea agreement, which encompassed both Serenity's murder and the 2004 rape case, under consideration, saying, A decision will be made by the court in the near future. Joshua himself did not attend the hearing due to health issues. According to the Ashtabula Star Beacon, A judgment entry directed the Ashtabula County Prosecutor's Office to submit a brief to the court explaining why the court should accept the plea deal, which includes a significant reduction in the charges related to the murder case. Despite Ms. O'Toole's claims that she had worked directly with the family while crafting the plea agreement, on October 16th, the Star Beacon published a letter from one of Serenity's family members that clearly indicated they were not on board. The letter read, I am the great-aunt of the one-year-old baby, Serenity, who was murdered in Conneaut, Ohio, on October 7, 2017. Serenity was found in her home, dead with her skull caved in. Serenity's mother's boyfriend, Joshua Gerdo, fled the city, fled the state, 
and was ultimately taken into custody by authorities in Pennsylvania. Mr. Gerdo has since been sitting in the Ashtabula County Jail awaiting trial for the past four years. Serenity's family is appalled and horrified by the way this case has been handled by our new county prosecutor. Currently, Prosecutor Colleen O'Toole is attempting to force a plea deal down the throats of both Serenity's family and the public, which would result in Mr. Gerdo receiving 18 years in prison. This is a travesty if allowed to occur. Serenity's head was crushed, and there is enough direct and circumstantial evidence to convict Mr. Gerdo of this cold and calculated act. We were assured by the Office of the Ashtabula County Prosecuting Attorney in 2018 that Mr. Gerdo would never see the light of day. Nicholas Iorochi, then the prosecutor, assured Serenity's family that there was enough evidence to put this monster behind bars for the rest of his life. Now, our new law and order prosecutor, Colleen O'Toole, has told us that the family should accept a plea deal because she didn't believe that a jury would convict Mr. Gerdo. It seems to me that Ms. O'Toole is lacking in the courtroom experience and confidence necessary to effectively perform her job. If the court approves Ms. O'Toole's plea deal with Mr. Gerdo, what is life worth? My beautiful niece, Serenity, only lived one year. She never had a chance to start life, go to school, to grow up, or to do any of the normal things children do. Mr. Gerdo, on the other hand, if O'Toole gets her way, will have the opportunity to start life over again in 18 years. How can anyone with a conscience or an ounce of humanity allow this to happen? The family of Serenity Jazz Sky Sutley, Conneaut. Proving the world isn't entirely foobar. On October 20th, it was reported that Judge Cezanne had rejected the plea agreement. In a statement, the judge said her reasoning for rejecting the plea deal would remain sealed. At the time, Joshua's trial for the 2004 rape case was scheduled to begin on October 29th, but the trial was continued for two reasons. The first was because one of Joshua's three attorneys was involved in a federal trial that was expected to last three to four days, so they requested a continuance of Joshua's trial preparation conference scheduled for October 26th. The second was due to an outbreak of COVID-19 in Ashtabula County. As of this recording, the rape and burglary trial is scheduled to begin on December 3, 2021, with a backup trial date of December 10. A trial preparation conference is now scheduled to be held on November 30th. No trial date has been set for Serenity's murder trial. Witchcraft. The occult. Extremist beliefs. Murder. Tune in to Rogue Darkness each Friday and join host Raven as I uncover horrific crimes committed under the misconceptions and misunderstandings of witchcraft and other belief systems. I'll cover a wide range of crimes involving ritualistic killings and extremist beliefs to cult persuasion and supposed possession. Anything and everything that borders the line of horrifying. There's always three sides to a story. Side A, Side B, and then the truth. Let's uncover the truth together and explore the darkness of mankind, one crime at a time. Available wherever you get your podcast fix, simply by searching Rogue Darkness. Today's next update involves the story of the little guy I covered in episode 24. Last year, a series of strange events led to the discovery of the partially mummified, significantly undernourished remains of five-year-old Josias Marquez in a duffel bag in the trunk of his mother's vehicle. Josias, who suffered from a bout of meningitis shortly after birth that left him with cerebral palsy and epilepsy, has been described as high needs as he was blind, unable to walk, crawl, feed himself or speak, and completely reliant on others for care. The case came to light in January of 2020 when two children, a then six-year-old boy and two-year-old girl, showed up on a neighbor's doorstep unattended, telling the neighbor their mother, Sagal Hussein, had been gone overnight and still hadn't returned. The neighbor called police, and officers soon located Sigal, who claimed she had been running errands. When investigators learned the woman had a third child, she told them his father lived in Michigan and had taken him in January, but she was unable to reach the man and did not have his phone number. CPS stayed on top of Seagal throughout February and March, but she was never able to produce either Josias or proof that he was safe. Finally, near the end of March, investigators received information that contradicted Seagal's statement about the identity of Josias's father, who, they determined, was a man named James Marquez who lived in San Jose, California. 
they ultimately determined that no one other than Seagal herself had reported seeing Josias since November 25, 2019. Due to the inconsistencies in her stories and her refusal to be truthful or cooperate with investigators, Seagal was arrested on March 30th on four charges of child neglect. Her other two children were taken into CPS custody, and police obtained a search warrant for her home and vehicle. The next day, Josias's remains were found in Seagal's vehicle. According to police, Seagal stopped giving Josias his prescribed medication in 2018. She's accused of refusing to provide Josias with any medical care other than the CBD oil she claims to have given him to treat his severe health conditions in place of his prescription medication, and a criminal complaint in the case alleges that Seagal neglected to feed Josias for a significant length of time. When his emaciated, partially mummified body was found in the trunk of Seagal's vehicle, it weighed approximately 20 pounds. Josias, when he was healthy, weighed over 30 pounds at his last doctor visit. 26-year-old Seagal Abdurshid Hussein was charged with multiple crimes, including chronic neglect of a child resulting in death, a Class B felony, hiding the corpse of a child, a Class F felony, neglect of a child under six years of age with a disability, neglect of a child, five counts of obstructing an officer, and forgery. In March of this year, Fox 11 News reported that a plea deal may be in the works, although no details were available. The agreement came to fruition when, on October 12, 2021, Seagal pleaded no contest to five charges, child neglect resulting in death, hiding the corpse of a child, obstruction, and two counts of neglecting a child. Her remaining five counts were dismissed. Of the charges on which Seagal was convicted, child neglect resulting in death is the most serious, carrying a maximum sentence of 25 years in prison. Defense attorney Tim Hogan told the press that Seagal's plea agreement will allow both the defense and the prosecution to argue for what each feels is the appropriate sentence. Seagal's sentencing hearing is scheduled to take place on December 7th, after which I'll provide an update as soon as I can. If you follow me on Facebook, you're probably more than familiar with the story of two-year-old James Riker Beale, who I covered in episode 26 last summer. James's story is one of the most complicated I've covered, but I'll try to give you the cliff notes in case you're not familiar. James's parents, Kara Witkowski and Thomas Beale, broke up in early 2019 after Kara accused Tom of raping her twice. These accusations are confirmed by text messages between the two in which Tom admits to raping Kara. According to Kara, much of their relationship was fraught with psychological and emotional abuse on Tom's part, but the second rape was the final straw. After she obtained a protective order against him, the former couple began a contentious custody battle for their two children, a four-year-old daughter and then one-year-old James. In May of 2019, Tom managed to convince a family court judge to grant an emergency custody order by falsely claiming that Kara's PTSD made her an unfit parent. That summer, Kara made multiple reports that when her children came home from visitation with their father, they were covered in injuries. She also reported that her daughter made multiple disclosures that members of Tom's family were touching her and James inappropriately. Despite these reports, and despite Tom being under investigation for possession of child pornography, in August, Kara was completely stripped of custody of, and access to, her children. The same month, James was repeatedly hospitalized with a prolapsed rectum so severe, even multiple surgeries failed to correct it. On October 31, 2019, just a few weeks after his second birthday, James died in the home Tom shared with his father and stepmother. Within 24 hours, the Palatine Police Department issued a statement saying foul play was not suspected, even though James's cause of death was not immediately apparent and had not been determined yet. The state's autopsy, which was performed by a fellow in training at the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office who was not certified to perform the procedure, ruled James's death natural by unknown causes. Kara, who the family court judge barred from attending her own son's funeral, raised the funds to have a second, independent autopsy conducted, the findings of which were completely different from the first. Ultimately, Kara's forensic pathologist determined that James's death was caused by complications from a spinal cord injury not even mentioned in the first autopsy. I've said it once and I'll say it again. If Kara didn't have such meticulous documentation proving every claim and allegation she makes, I might not believe this story. I think it would be hard for anyone to believe it. The depths of the corruption and injustice and flat-out evil this woman and her children have encountered are unfathomable. 
If you're not familiar with James's story, I implore you to dig into it. I've written about it on the blog and talked about it on the podcast, in addition to making multiple social media posts about it, but Kara's Justice for James Facebook page is the rabbit hole I recommend falling down to learn more. When I tell you her documentation is meticulous, I am in no way exaggerating. She has court documents and screenshots and photos and everything else you could possibly need to put the story together. She has effectively done all of the work the Palatine Police Department should have been doing in the first place. Yet to date, no investigation has been done into James's death. Countless people could have intervened to prevent James's death and stop his abuse. In particular, two former family court judges, John Dalton and Renee Cruz, bear a good deal of responsibility for what has happened to this family, not to mention former guardian ad litem Julie Pirtle, who requested her own removal from the case just six days before James's death. She did this after recommending full custody be given to James's father, who was still at the time under investigation for possession of child sexual abuse images that were found on a hard drive he admitted was solely his property. I'm not sure how she or the two judges I mentioned sleep at night, but I imagine it's on a pile of money, possibly stained with the proverbial blood of children. At least, that's how I imagine it. On the subject of GALs, whose job it is to protect and advocate for children, one item Kara posted that I hadn't seen before left me staring at my computer screen in stunned silence. Two days before James's death, on October 29, 2019, Judge Renee Cruz received an email from an attorney whose name I won't mention, which read in part, As co-chair of the Family Law Committee, please be advised that I have been approached by various attorneys that are on the Kane County GAL list with concerns of being appointed to serve as GAL on the now infamous Beale v. Witkowski matter, as they fear for the safety of their person and their family. That email leads me to wonder what these prospective GALs felt they had to fear and from whom. Nothing Kara had ever done or said could possibly have incited such mortal fear in a group of attorneys. Were they afraid of what Tom and his family were capable of, particularly considering their wealth and influence? Or were they more concerned about what would happen to them if they made decisions that were actually in the best interests of the children against the wishes of these judges? On a slightly brighter note, I do want to report a very important development in the actual case. On July 22, 2021, 33-year-old Thomas Jerry Beal was arrested on a charge of criminal sexual assault using force a Class X felony stemming from his sexual assault on Kara in early 2019. Within hours of his arrest, Tom was released on bond. I'm truly hoping this charge is just the tip of the iceberg, but what happens with this case is anyone's guess. It's high time all of the bad actors in this case start to face the consequences of their actions. In November, the California Protective Parents Association presented the 2021 Justice for Children Leader Award to not only Kara Witkowski, but also Brianna Michelow, the mother of six-year-old Corey Michelow, whose story I told in episode 69. The work these ladies and so many others are doing to protect children from the same tragic outcomes their children met, all the while grieving the loss of their own children, is beyond admirable. And if you don't follow both the Justice for James page and the Justice for Corey page on Facebook, please do so. It's so incredibly important to amplify not only the voices of these children, but the voices of their loving parents as well. As I mentioned in last week's update episode, the trial of Jared Burgess, the man accused of causing three-year-old Arabella Parker's fatal injuries on October 10, 2019, in Treverton, Pennsylvania, both began and ended last week. This episode will be released just two days after the two-year anniversary of Arabella's death. The little girl spent nearly six weeks on life support before taking her last breath on November 22, 2019, in the loving arms of her Aunt Mandy. Since I just gave a synopsis of Arabella's case last week, I won't go through it all over again today. Jared was the boyfriend of Arabella's mother, Samantha Delcamp, who is also charged in her daughter's death. Jared's mother, Christy Willis, was convicted in April of lying to police about the timing of the fatal incident, and she is currently appealing her sentence of 17 months to 17 years in prison. Thanks once again to Francis Scarcella of The Daily Item, who has stuck with Arabella's story from minute one, I was able to keep up with the trial day by day. So now, I'll give you a brief rundown of what took place in the Northumberland County Courthouse last week. On Monday, November 15, 2021, from a pool of 225 potential jurors, 
a jury of seven men and five women was chosen to determine whether or not 21-year-old Jared Burgess would be convicted of the multiple charges against him. Jared sat at the defense table, wearing dress pants and a white polo shirt, and accompanied by his defense attorney, Richard Fudale, who asked Northumberland County President Judge Charles Saylor to disallow testimony during the trial, stating that Jared had a history of abusing Arabella. Of course, District Attorney Tony Matulowicz, one of the superheroes of this story, objected, telling the court that the case against Jared hinged on proving a course of abusive conduct against the three-year-old. Fortunately, Judge Saylor said the testimony would be allowed, and the defense's objections would be addressed at trial. Arabella's maternal aunt, Mandy Kegler, who was given custody of Arabella in the weeks prior to her death and who had to make the difficult decision to remove her niece from life support, told Mr. Scarcella, It's time for justice for Arabella. I am ready for this trial. The trial itself began on Tuesday, November 16th at 9.15 a.m. with opening arguments in which the district attorney told the jury that Jared Burgess was responsible for the brutal beating death of three-year-old Arabella Margaret Parker. According to Francis Scarcella's coverage, Burgess was very active in the courtroom during the trial's opening Tuesday morning. He regularly whispers to his attorney, takes notes, and instructs Fewdale as witnesses took the stand Tuesday morning. Those witnesses included three state troopers who all said that Jared changed his story multiple times about what happened to Arabella the night she was fatally injured. On Tuesday afternoon, Samantha Delcamp took the stand. Mr. Matulowicz previously told the court that Samantha was testifying despite no plea agreement between her defense and the prosecution being reached. Samantha's testimony lasted for nearly three hours, and Mr. Scarcella reported, At times, she wept as she looked at pictures of her daughter. According to Samantha's testimony, she was washing the dishes on the evening of October 10, 2019, when Jared went into the living room to check on Arabella and ensure she was eating. When he found she wasn't, he began screaming at her, and Samantha testified that she heard a thud and ran into the living room to find Jared pinning Arabella against the wall. When she tried to stop it, Samantha said, Jared pushed her to the ground. He then threw Arabella toward her toy couch in the center of the room, and although her lower body landed on the little foam couch, her head struck the floor, causing her to collapse in a seizure. Several times during Mr. Fewdale's questioning of Samantha and the other witnesses earlier in the day, Jared interrupted his attorney, saying loudly, Fewdale, come here. Between flipping through hundreds of pages of documents, Jared frequently stood up from the defense table, pointing at his attorney and telling him what questions to ask. It's no surprise the little twerp is a control freak, based on what we've heard so far in this case but it was handy of him to put it on public display like that before the jury and the judge. Also in Samantha's testimony, she claimed Jared beat her so badly while she was pregnant with his baby that she miscarried. Evidently, the testimony about the pregnancy was a surprise to both Jared and his attorney, who objected, saying this was the first they had heard of the pregnancy and they had not received any documentation to back up Samantha's claims. Judge Saylor told the jury to disregard Samantha's statements about the pregnancy. One more statement Samantha made on the stand is disturbing, if true. In addition to Jared's regular beatings of herself and Arabella, one bizarre punishment she claimed he enacted on them was to make both Samantha and her daughter walk around the living room naked with their hands in the air after being beaten. When questioned by the prosecutor, who asked if she was offered any deals or been pressured into testifying by anyone, Samantha said, No, I want to do this so no one else gets hurt. On Wednesday, the judge heard from medical staff as well as law enforcement. First, the neurosurgeon who removed part of Arabella's brain, Dr. Alejandro Bugarini of Geisinger Medical Center, testified, saying if the defendants were honest about Arabella's injuries, if it was stated from the get-go, we could have been more prompt in treating her. Minutes and seconds matter. This was a devastating injury. Dr. Bugarini testified that the right side of Arabella's brain had died due to swelling and bleeding the doctors were unable to control and that an injury of that type and severity was impossible to incur from a simple fall. Also on the stand that day was Dr. Paul Bellino, who I mentioned last week had testified at Jared's preliminary hearing. Dr. Bellino said, Had we known earlier, we would have taken a different approach and taken her to the nearest hospital before flying her to Danville. We would have had every member of a care team available and ready. Trooper Brian Siebert and former trooper Corporal Rob Reeves also took the stand testifying to their belief that Jared had beaten Arabella on the day she received her head injury. On Thursday, Jared himself took the stand, telling the court he did hit Arabella as discipline. I smacked her, but not hard or excessive, maybe five times. He admitted to kicking Arabella, but not with all of his strength. 
He also admitted he tapped the little girl in the face and hit her in the butt at times. When she wasn't eating on the night of October 10th, he said, he grabbed her by the shoulders, and he also admitted to throwing her onto her foam couch. I didn't forcibly throw her to hurt her, but I should have walked her the extra couple of steps to put her on the couch. A misthrow is a misthrow, but accidents happen. I'm embarrassed, but I didn't mean to hurt this child. I have to live with it every day. I love and miss Arabella. When Mr. Matulowitz questioned him about bruises on Arabella's body, Jared said he didn't cause them and instead believed the bruises were caused by EMS and by doctors during surgery. Jared's manner on the stand was confrontational and even aggressive when responding to questioning by Mr. Matulowitz. This exchange happened at one point. Jared, I don't know what you're trying to get me to say. D.A. Are you saying that three state troopers and two doctors lied under oath? Jared. Yes. He tried to tell the court that police pressured him into making false admissions, although the video recorded police interview indicated otherwise. Telling the jury he still grieved for Arabella, he said, I didn't plan for her to die. I hope she forgives me. I pray to her and God every night to forgive me. I did not intend to do this. Samantha took the stand for a second time on Thursday, testifying again that Jared hit Arabella while Mr. Fudale tried to make her admit she was lying. Arabella's father, Carl Parker, was also called to testify. Carl is currently in jail, as I mentioned last week, on DUI and other charges. When Carl entered the courtroom, he stared down Jared all the way to the witness stand. Jared never even glanced at him. Part of me just can't help wishing Carl could have even a minute alone in a room with the little weasel who just called beating Arabella to death a misthrow. I doubt Carl would need much longer than that to get his point across. The defense's closing arguments on Thursday included Mr. Fudale telling the jury that Samantha is a liar and implying he didn't believe she hadn't worked with the prosecution on a plea deal for her testimony. Here's a random nauseating detail for you. While Mr. Matulowitz gave the prosecution's closing arguments, defense attorney Fudale sat at the defense table and rubbed Jared's shoulders. During his closing argument, Mr. Matulowitz told the jury that Jared's combination of beating, waiting, and lying constituted murder. Jared Burgess had a motive for this child to die. His narrative switched to his own self-interest at that moment when he was presented with different evidence each and every time. As to why Jared waited almost an hour to allow a 911 call to be placed, he knew the jig was up and he was going to be going to jail. He knew he was in serious trouble if Arabella went to the hospital because they would see the bruises from the beatings she received. He also mentioned that Samantha is no angel and that the district attorney's office did not make any deals with her and did not intend to. The jury deliberated for about an hour and a half on Thursday before returning with a verdict, finding 21-year-old Jared Joseph Burgess guilty of felony charges of third-degree murder, aggravated assault on a person under six, child endangerment, obstruction, and two counts of aggravated assault on a person under 13, as well as two misdemeanors, simple assault and reckless endangerment. He was found not guilty of one felony count of aggravated assault and one misdemeanor count of simple assault. While his verdict was read, Jared stared straight ahead while Arabella's family exchanged hugs of relief. Mandy Kegler told the reporter, This is justice for Arabella. We are pleased with the result and thank the jury. Carl's older daughter, Arabella's big sister, Amanda, said, This is absolutely some justice for my sister. I am very happy we were able to get this result and some justice for Arabella. Judge Saylor thanked the jury for its service and ordered Jared to remain in jail on $750,000 bail until he is sentenced. He faces up to 40 years in prison on just the murder conviction. The judge will decide if the combined penalties for the other charges will run consecutively or concurrently. Defense attorney Fudale said he is unsure if they will appeal the verdict. Mr. Matulowitz said, I am very pleased with the jury. The state police did a very thorough investigation. The state police built an extremely powerful case and collected enormous amounts of evidence. The jury sat here for four days, and that's a big ask. It's difficult. Just to clear up the murder charge, Pennsylvania is one of only three states, including Minnesota and Florida, where third-degree murder is a valid charge. According to the prosecution in this case, a charge of third-degree homicide means the person showed extreme indifference to the value of human life knowing their actions were dangerous but committing them anyway and causing a person's death as a result. First-degree murder requires elements of maliciousness and premeditation, whereas second-degree murder is committed during the commission of another felony. 
a status conference hearing for Samantha's case has been scheduled for December 20, 2021, at 9.15 a.m. She will likely face trial in early 2022. I have to say, my stance on Samantha has softened somewhat since I initially covered Arabella's case last year. I do believe she deserves to be convicted of some of her charges, but the longer I follow the story, the less I feel Samantha should be found guilty of her murder charge. It's not up to me, though, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens. If nothing else, I wholeheartedly hope Arabella's story will open the eyes of other women or men who find themselves in relationships with violent, abusive people. I'm relieved the jury in Jared's trial ruled the way it did. My thoughts are with Arabella's family. I hope this verdict helps them to move forward despite their grief. Jared's sentencing hearing is currently scheduled for January 4th, 2022. The last case I'll update today is that of Connor and Brinley Snyder, whose story I told in episode 29 and is still among the most horrific I've ever heard. As some of you may remember, on September 23, 2019, 36-year-old Lisa Rochelle Snyder called 911 to report that she had discovered her children, 8-year-old Connor and 4-year-old Brinley, unresponsive and hanging by their necks from either end of a vinyl-coated wire dog lead in the basement of the family's home in Albany Township, Pennsylvania. Right off the bat, Lisa began laying the groundwork for her story, telling the 911 dispatcher that Connor was bullied and had made threats of committing such an act. Police were unable to find a single person who knew anything about Connor being bullied. In fact, across the board, everyone said Connor seemed like a happy, carefree child with a lot of friends. Three days after they were found hanging and unresponsive, on Thursday, September 26, 2019, Connor and Brinley died just 14 minutes apart in the pediatric intensive care unit at Lehigh Valley Hospital in Cedar Crest. An investigation led police to Lisa's mobile devices, on which they discovered Lisa had made searches including carbon monoxide in a car, how long to die, I almost got away with it, best episodes, hanging yourself, and does a hybrid car produce carbon monoxide while idling. Her digital records also showed she had visited a website detailing an effective way of hanging a person using a short drop and simple suspension. Adding just one more element of horror to the case was evidence that Lisa had sexually abused the family dog and shared images of the abuse with an as-yet unidentified man. Two months after her children's deaths, Lisa Snyder was arrested at her home on December 2, 2019, and booked into Berks County Prison on charges including two counts each of first-degree and third-degree murder, endangering the welfare of children, tampering with evidence, and one count each of cruelty to animals and sexual intercourse with an animal. Prosecutors announced in March of 2020 that they planned to seek the death penalty for Lisa. In late 2020, Lisa's defense attorneys filed a 43-page motion containing several requests, including a request for the animal abuse charges to be separated from the charges relating to her children's murders. Of the animal abuse charges, the motion said the charges had no bearing on the case and would impermissibly inflame the passions of and unfairly prejudice the jury. Also included in the motion was a request for a change of venue due to extensive pretrial publicity in Berks County, as well as a request to withhold evidence from the jury, including Lisa's statements to police, crime scene photos, Lisa's Facebook messages, items seized during physical and digital searches, and her online search history. Her attorneys claimed the searches had not been authenticated and the lewd, lascivious, and taboo nature of the evidence could prevent her from receiving a fair trial. The motion also claimed that Lisa had a chronic history of severe mental disorders dating back to when she was 16 years old, including major depression with psychotic features, anxiety disorder, affective disorder, and postpartum depression. At the time her children were killed, the motion continued, Lisa suffered from severe chronic major depressive disorder borderline personality disorder, and symptoms consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder, multiple personality disorder, and dissociative disorder. This, the attorneys claimed, led Lisa to believe Connor and Brinley were being put in physical, psychological, or emotional pain by others, and gave Lisa a desire to protect her children from feelings of abandonment and or to alleviate the painful feelings and situations they were experiencing at the time. As a result of Lisa's various alleged mental issues, Her attorneys intend to attempt an insanity defense when her case ultimately goes to trial. 
As far as the 43-page motion, a hearing took place in April of 2021, during which Berks County President Judge Paul Yatron gave indications that he may grant the defense motion to sever Lisa's animal abuse charges from the homicide charges. He told Assistant District Attorney Margaret McCollum that he couldn't envision a reason a jury should hear the vulgar details of the animal abuse charges that wouldn't prejudice jurors, saying, I'm telling you right now, you have a huge burden to carry. As such, the judge did not allow Trooper Jordan Hoffman to read into the record a sexually explicit exchange between Lisa and the unidentified man I mentioned earlier. State police investigators testified that after police seized Lisa's mobile devices, she called the barracks angry and demanded to speak to a supervisor, complaining that they had seized a phone she purchased after her children's hanging. Corporal John Sloboda testified that when he questioned Lisa about a supposedly missing Samsung phone, She told him she left it on the roof of her car when dropping Brinley off at preschool prior to August 26th, which was the first day of the new school year. However, Corporal John Maggs, a vehicle technology expert, testified that the Samsung phone was paired with the Bluetooth in Lisa's vehicle on September 27th, which was four days after the incident that ultimately caused Connor and Brinley's deaths. Although there was no news coverage of this next detail, I was surprised to find it in Lisa's court documents. Apparently, on September 2nd, Judge Yatron granted the defense's motion to sever her charges of animal cruelty and sexual intercourse with an animal from her other seven charges. It doesn't appear that any decision has been made on the rest of the issues brought up in the motion filed over a year ago now. Lisa's next status hearing is scheduled to take place at 1.30 p.m. on December 13th, 2021. I try to stay on top of the updates in every case I've followed since I started the blog back in early 2019. There is only one of me, and trying to keep up to date on dozens of cases while also covering new ones most weeks has been no easy feat, so unfortunately, I haven't been as consistent as I want to be with the blog updates. My intention with these case update episodes is to fill in those gaps and keep us all current on the ongoing cases I've covered. I'll never be someone who can cover a case just to drop a sensational headline and then never come back to it. I'm truly invested in each and every child's story. As many of you know, most important to me is that all of the kids I talk about are never forgotten, even after their cases are closed and, with any luck, their abusers and killers are locked away. I don't want to remember the kids just for the horrible deaths they suffered. I want to remember them for the amazing little people they were. That's why it means so much to me to learn as much as I can about each child, who they were, and what they loved. They deserve to be remembered for not just how they died, but who they were. My sources for this episode were the Ashtabula Star Beacon, News 5 Cleveland, the Ohio Department of Corrections website, the Ashtabula County, Ohio Court System e-access, WKYC 3 News, Fox 11 News, Justice for James on Facebook, The Daily Item, WNEP ABC 16, The Morning Call, and the Unified Judicial System of Pennsylvania web portal. That's it for this week. Join me next week for a new story. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com, where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to SufferTheLittleChildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.